So for those of you who don't know what the harmonics are, these are the triads. So there are three triangles here in the Enneagram and Russ Hudson discovered these triads in the 90s. And I say discovered deliberately because there's such power in them that you'll see they have an intrinsic um, depth and relevance. So he discovered them and there are three of them there. So the top one there, competency, is types one, three, and five. And that's the little black dot in the middle of that triad. And they're the symbol that we've chosen for the competency triad is the robots, and you'll see why. Then you've got the emotional realness triad, which is the eight, six, and four. And we've got the gorilla there making a very strong demonstration of its feelings. And the emotional realness triad used to be called the emotional reactivity triad or the reactive triad. And another name for it was the intensity triad. But then Russ renamed it twice to try and be more egalitarian and not to stigmatize the one triad over the other. So if there's any residue here of negativity, it's not intended. And you'll see why the emotional realness triad is so um, critical to our functioning. Then you've got the positive outlook triad, which is types nine, two, and seven. And they are the happy balloons flying up into the sky. So just a way to help you try and remember um, which triad is which. So this diagram will come up again. This pinging is ongoing. Are you recording, Renata? Yes, I am. Um... Yeah, sorry, Ing. I'd, I'd, I can't get rid of the pinging now. Um, uh, well, never mind. We just yeah. carry on. It's, okay. it's just it shows being off, but it's just not. I don't know why. Maybe it's on my settings because I'm co-hosting. But anyway, I don't want to fiddle with it now. Okay, so the harmony triads, as you can guess, are one of the places where we run into major disharmony. And... A lot of, when you, when you discover what's in the harmony triads today, you're probably going to have, have a lot of realizations about how your relationships have gone wrong in the past and how your collaborations with people have gone wrong in the past. So we've got three type, types here, three triads here that can really misunderstand each other. So the positive outlook is going to be the one saying, don't worry, it's going to be fine. It's great. I love you. We're going to get there. We've got such a great team. Let's just keep going. It's going to be great. Then you've got the emotional realness one reacting to that saying, excuse me, wait a minute. You're not actually hearing me. There are some issues here that we need to deal with for real. You know, just saying everything's going to be fine is not going to make it fine. And then you've got the competency triad who's going to just say, look, this is getting too emotional. There's stuff to be done here. We've got a deadline. Let's just get it done. And, you know, in the interests of efficiency, can I suggest that we just do X, Y, and Z? So you've got three people coming at something from different perspectives. And the one is going to be able, the, the positive one is going to try and bring hope and inspiration. The realness one is going to be bringing um, authenticity and try and communicate what's really going on, including doubts and trepidation. And then you've got the sober, realistic, focused competency triad saying, okay, what do we need to do? You know, let's not get sidetracked by this. And, you know, let's get some focus here. So each one you can see immediately has a particular gift to bring to a problem solving situation. And if you think about the fact that as human beings, we constantly adaptively problem solving. It's literally part of what we're doing every single day, all the time. The fixated ego is not going to allow us to bring integration between these three. If we fixated in one triad, in our own type, and in our own um, harmonic stance, we're not going to be able to integrate the other two. We're not going to be able to appreciate them. And we might even consider that person an enemy, feel a certain level of contempt for their orientation to a problem. And it's going to cause breakdowns and disharmony. 
And the more that we can consciously begin to appreciate the necessity of these different triads and what they bring to the table and how much value they add, and also the partial nature of our own perspective, the more effective we're going to be and the more integrated. So it's a very, it's very analogous to type structure per se. If you're stuck in your own type, you're only going to be seeing one ninth, you know, um, of what reality has to offer. And the, the objective here is to try and be fluid, responsive. If you think about things like um, agile innovation, you're not going to be able to be agile and responsive and have cognitive flexibility if you aren't able to integrate what the moment demands. And that is a full range of competencies and skills. It's a f the ability to appreciate things from different lenses. So the harmonics really helps um, teams to become a lot better at being more fluid, agile, responsive, collaborative, and appreciative of one another's lenses. And I think because there are only three orientations that you're dealing with here, in a corporate context, it's actually a very helpful way of working with a team because they don't have to remember nine different things and you can catalyze a big shift very quickly. And it's not so much about individuals, it's not so much about personality types. Um, it becomes more problem centric, which I think is, it creates safety. Okay, so here are some of the jokes that Russ Hudson makes about this stuff, which I quite enjoy. So this is if you have two positive outlook people married to one another, everything was great until the divorce. Then you've got, if you've got two emotional realness people married to each other, it's just, uh, eventually we just wore each other out. That there's just only so much crockery you can throw at each other and only so many 3 a.m. arguments you can have that go on for two days before you just tire each other out. And then you've got the competency triad. So if you have two of these people in a, in a relationship with one another, the relationship can eventually just die because of a lack of emotional intimacy, a lack of electricity and fire, and, you know, somebody always arrives home and doesn't forget to buy the chlorine or whatever, but there's no dynamism in the relationship. It just kind of functions at a very practical level. Renata, are you laughing? Tell us. No, I'm a self-preservation three. And my last relationship was with a self-preservation three. And that's exactly what happened. Eventually, it was just like, what happened? It just was ice cold and dead. It was like, oh, okay. <laughs> we never fought. There was never any emotional realness. It just frittered out and died a, 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 a death of no emotion. Very functional. But um, that's exactly what happened. It's hysterical. Yeah, for sure. Oh, it's very funny. So yeah, these are these are give you give you a hint of some of the the risks and the downsides of only having one lens involved here. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the positive features that are contributed by each of these styles in a little bit more depth. So mention holiday in Paris to the positive outlook types, and this might be what's going on in their mind. The seven, nine, and two, it's all beautiful and rosy. They're the ones who hold vision, creation, a creative, a, a vision for creative problem solving. So they, this term, hold possibility, is Russ Hudson's term. And I think that's the nicest summary I've come across of the positive outlook harmonic triad, is I am the one as a seven, nine, or two, who holds the possibility of something very beautiful and good. Something true and beautiful and good. I'm the one thinking about that. What can reality be like? What kind of human society could we create? How could we create a more kind, loving and just world? 
how can we change the status quo to, to be more human? These are the kinds of questions that if you're in the positive outlook um, triad, you're going to be enjoying these questions. You're going to be feeling, yes, that matters to me. Um, how are we going to be kinder to each other and put people first? And so that you can hear that it holds an ideal. There's a genuine positive ideal that is very human centric held in this triad. And it's also the one that's going to be encouraging and saying it's going to be okay. Don't worry. It's fine. It's okay that the project was a complete disaster and failed and we lost 3 billion rand. It's still it's still going to be okay. We're still human. We still love each other. You know, it's, it's going to be, no matter what happens, we're holding on to something good in the situation. So that's what you can count on this triad to do, to bring some of that um, into the mix. So there's that encouragement and lightness. You know how nines create the sense of ease and harmony. They make you feel... Um, a lack of judgment, you feel welcome. And the twos are there connecting with you at a profoundly human level. And you know, when you're working with twos, that that matters more. Everything comes second to the human heart. And so that's what we, what the positive outlook types will bring and infuse into a team. So they help us to not succumb to discouragement and despair and nihilism, hopelessness. And so, you know, and we all know how crushing reality can be. Let's not get ourselves here. No. So, so the positive outlook types bring some sustaining sense of goodness into, into any situation. Okay. Then you mentioned holiday in Paris to the emotional realness. And this might look more six or eight, um, maybe less four, but let's not forget their riots on the streets of Paris, things are on fire, the um, yellow vests are rioting, the place is in absolute chaos. What do you mean holiday in Paris? Are you shrooming? No, who wants to go there anyway? So the, the emotional realness types are going to have a very different reaction to things. And what are they bringing to the mix here? That point number three, the bullshit radar. You need these people in the mix to say, excuse me, what are you thinking? Are you dreaming? You know, um, do you actually understand the risks of what you're proposing? So they're the ones that are going to be authentic. They're going to stop a process dead in its tracks and say, sorry, can I just ask a question? I've got some concerns. They're going to want to raise the issues. They're going to want to ask the difficult questions. They're going to be the one who says, we tried that project two years ago. And it was an absolute disaster. It cost us, you know, 700 million rand. And these are the things that went wrong. And they're going to not hold back for fear of upsetting somebody because they've got a legitimate and real concern to put on the table. Their interest is in authenticity. So this is very much about trust. If we aren't on the same page emotionally about what is real, then there's very little chance that we're gonna to come to a successful solution. If we're brushing things under the carpet and we're ignoring the fact that, you know, um, there's politics in the organization and we don't have the support of key stakeholders, we're going to overlook some very important information. And the emotional realness types are the ones who are not going to let that happen. They are concerned with, let's all get very real about what's going on here. The Enneagram fours are going to do it in a slightly different way. So the Enneagram four might be saying, can we just slow down a second? I'm feeling some disquiet about what's being said here. 
So they're going to be using their inner process to bring depth and authenticity to a conversation. So you can already get a hint of the shadow side of both of these things, and we're going to come back to that. But for now, I'm focusing on the positive. The emotional realness types also bring the possibility of compassion and healing. And if I say to you that a six and eight and a four are bringing compassion and healing, I bet you some of you are thinking, no ways, eight, no ways, six because we might be stuck in certain stereotypes about some of our Enneagram um, numbers. But the point that Russ Hudson makes about this is that you cannot have genuine healing and compassion without emotional realness. It's not possible. Um, and that in order to establish an authentic connection with another human being, it's going to involve getting real, stepping forward, in, engaging in the difficult conversations that an eight and a six and a four might be more ready to have that are going to lead to genuine breakthroughs and genuine trust and genuine connection. So these are some of the gifts that this type offers. So what I'm really doing, I'm giving you a lot of propaganda here to really appreciate the best of each of these triads. It's really, really important. And, and in your work with corporate teams, when you're using this stuff, um, it's, a, it's a very key message to bring. So powerful for the collaboration and teamwork to be able to say, right, are we on the same page? I notice you over there, you look a bit hesitant. What's going through your mind? Those are the kinds of questions that an emotional realness person would ask because they're not shying away from the, the realness. Okay. Competency. Holiday in Paris, the competency triad is starts going into action mode, planning, finding out the cost of the train tickets, where to stay, um, how long it takes to get from Châtelet to wherever. And um, they get very practical and concrete and on the detail very quickly. So these are the ones and the threes and the fives. Very efficient, no nonsense, not all romantic, not phased by, you know, the risks and the concerns too much. Just very much about let's get this thing done and make it happen. So you can see how important that would be. So imagine you let a team of five Enneagram nines design the Paris Metro, as opposed to letting a team of competency triad people design the Paris Metro. Um, I can imagine which team you would choose to do that for you if you were the city planner. Um, if you want things to work, if you want a rational system that's efficient, that's done with sobriety and realism, where there are efficient tools, planning. So the competency tried very good at stepping back from a situation, seeing the whole situation there, right, these are the resources we have, being able to disidentify. So to take the emotion out of the picture, this is also why ones and fives often mistype, is because of that gift of disidentification. Like, okay, here's the problem, here are the resources, here's the time frame, these are the people that we've got. Very good at seeing time. So there's some giftedness in this type of actually being able to see time in a way that other types find more challenging. So things like, you know, supply chain management. These are the kinds of things that competency types are really good at mapping out and understanding and, and um, bringing effectiveness into that. So it's about how to get a grip on a situation, create a solution, harness the resources and the capacities of the people and get things done quickly. So doing it in different ways. So the fives are seeing the patterns and the overarching system that holds things together, having that incisive insight into the patterns that are holding things together. Three is bringing that incredible efficiency. One's the ability to bring the attention to detail, 
and really bring the order that is needed to make things work. So I think you're probably getting quite a good flavor from these three slides and their pictures of what these different triads are about. So before we go any further, I just wanna get some questions on your understanding so far so that I don't rush forward. So can we stop there for a sec and let's hear any questions about what I've said so far. You're being very clear. Um, I'm wondering um, about a tri-type overlay here because I know that I've worked with a team that had predominantly seven thinking. So it was a, the, the team style was eight and they had a lot mm -hmm. of eight threes in the team. But mm -hmm. it was a large team and almost all of them had a seven thinking style. Um, yes. And what I noticed, even though they weren't uh, sevens, um, that the issue with it, and it was an executive team of a, a technology company, um, is that they realized that a lot of their problems were because their approach to problems was quick fix. So as soon as the problem was presented, they wouldn't think about it too much. They would just go into very quick fixes. Oh, it's going to be fine. We'll just do that. And then mm -hmm. they realized that they kept having to do a fix of the fix and a fix of the fix of the fix. Um, yes because they never stopped and really analyzed and went into the depth of the five being an eight team. They didn't spend enough time in five uh, and, and, and probably not enough in emotional realness either. So, you know, they were skirting over the kind of superficial level like, Oh, okay, fine. Just do this kind of thing. Um, and I think that with it being an eight style team with a lot of eights, um, it was also that like, let's just move to action. Let's just, you know, quickly. But uh, it, it kind of makes me think that even, even that kind of thinking style overlay when you've got a lot of people would tend to, to, to create a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, positive outlook, um, which is also called escapist, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just wanted to reflect on that and ask you. I'm you really think. glad you did because that is absolutely spot on. And the work that I'm doing at the moment is with that. It's definitely tri-type is critical. And I've got um, in the workshop that I'm doing on the 14th of November, it's about this. It's doing how do you analyze a team using tri-type and subtype. So this is a little snapshot of the team that... Uh, one of the case study teams. And so here you've got a little min middle management team and quite exactly what you're saying, Renata, there's not a seven in this team, but there's a hell of a lot too much positive outlook here. And there's only an SX7, I mean, an only a seven thinking style, which is going to be a derailer. They're missing five, um, they're missing six completely, they're missing two, so if you look at the tri-type of the team, there's, there's nobody bringing an alternative thinking style. So I find that it's, it's a very, very powerful and helpful way to look at a team composition to bring in the clustering of the um, harmonics, the subtypes, and the tri-types. Because what you're saying is exactly right. This team is going to have problems with over-optimism. So they've got a lot of um, competence here. They've got two main type threes, plus the self press um, one energy of the, of the one manager's action style, contributing to a lot of competency, a lot of um, uh, positive outlook, and then all the emotional realness in the team is only in one person, who happens to also be a woman. So there's a risk of that being um, suppressed in the interests of a fast solution that's not adequately thought through. So you can see when you bring tri-type and um, harmonics together, it surfaces team risk in a very, very powerful way. And I did the um, kind of background analysis for this team. It's a team in the Netherlands. I don't know if Pat's here. We're working together on this, it's her client. 
So I'm doing the background analysis and she interviewed me on video for, for her client. And she was just laughing because I've never met them, but I'm describing the dynamics and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And she's just cracking up because of how much you can actually tell about a team when you map it out in this way. So, so this is, um, this is what I'm focusing on a lot in the, in the upcoming workshop is how to do this. Then you throw in the managers and you've got two sevens as the boss. Now you know you've got serious problems when it comes to too much positive outlook. So we're, gonna, we're going to um, definitely be thinking about our own competency, tri our, our own triad in the, in the breakout room that we're gonna do. So we're not gonna get too um, into this detail now. That's a whole, a whole thing. What I want to take you back to is this. And we're going to have a breakout group where we are going to talk about how our own triad, where our home is. So me as a seven, my home is in the positive outlook. Renata's home is in the competency as a three. And um, Natasha, you're in the four, you're in the realness. In the, in the breakout room that we're going to go into now, what I want you to think about is how your triad, how your harmonic dominant um, triad showed up in the last big initiative that you undertook, whether it was planning a wedding or a big project that you had to launch. Reflect for a minute on how your harmonic showed up in that work. I just want to make sure before we go into the breakout group, are there any more questions about these three? This, this, and this. So that we make sure we've got um, a good handle on the, the kind of flavor of each of these triads. Any questions before the breakout group? I'll put this slide on. This is like the summary summary. Yeah, Mina. In your summary summary and a positive outlook, yeah. um, this positive outlook tells emotional readiness 846. Is that right? It's basically as if there's a conversation going on between these, these three. Okay. So, so I'll be sitting with Natasha and Renata and I'll say to Natasha, don't worry, it's going to be fine. I love you. Everything's going to work out. And she's saying, no, you're not getting me. You're not hearing me. There's something I'm trying to say here. And I've said it before and you didn't listen last time. Can we actually please talk about this? And then Renata as a, as a competency is going to say, guys, we've got to start the session in 10 minutes. Can we actually just put this aside and focus on the task at hand? So this is set up almost as a little dialogue between the three. So positive outlook will say to emotional realness, don't worry, it's fine. Emotional realness will say back, no. And competency will then jump in and say, please, can we get on with it here? So can you see how the dialogue could work between the three of them? Yes, no, certainly. So it's making sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Ingrid, Ingrid, I'm trying to ask something, but I don't know. I don't know if it's a right time in the flow of what you're doing, and that is um, how 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 Russ Hudson actually decided to bring these things in. You know, do you know what the what the um, inspiration was, or the trigger for it, or whatever? Is this the right time to ask it? First of all. You're just giving me the invitation to one of my stupid Enneagram comments. But um, you know how it is in Enya land. Oscar Echaza said that he channeled this thing from the Archangel Metatron. So God alone knows where Russ Hudson got this. Um, half of the Enneagram comes from esoteric sources. So I, I don't know exactly how he got the inspiration, but uh, it's, it's very... 
I think yeah. he just noticed a pattern. You know, he's a five and he's good at noticing patterns. I think that's what he said. He just noticed a pattern with, with, with those uh, two triads, yeah. Ingrid, um, I just want to uh, make a comment and then also an observation. Yeah, so I think um, all the triads come from working with, you know, the laws of three. So I think that's probably where where Russ got, um, you know, this is another law of three, all the triads. Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding really interesting is, so, so I'm a three and yeah, I can relate to the competency and I think it goes also in a little bit of an order, you know, so first would be my competency response and then um, my emotional realness because eight would be, you know, in my tri type in the action center. And then positive outlook um, would probably be the third one. So it's quite interesting just to notice that flow on an individual level as well. Definitely. So if you know your tri type, you're going to be able to see the concentration of the harmonics in your style. So me as a seven, nine, four, I've got two positives and an emotionally real and zero competence. And you'll be looking at this thing now, able to see, have I got anything missing? Have I got one of each? And um, you're very lucky and blessed if you do have one of each that comes a bit more naturally to you. If you're a 792, then you're going to have to do a lot of work to access the others. But we are going to get to that a little bit later on. Um, after the first breakout group, we'll come back and get some feedback. And then in the second breakout group, we're going to be talking about how to access the others. Okay. So and first, just to, add, just to add to that, for those who use the IQ9 report and the coaching companion, it gives a percentage for each of the harmonics, which, you, you know, you, it's up to everybody to kind of see how, how much that resonates, but it does give you a clue when working with yourself and your clients as well. It gives you a percentage for each in, in the stacking. Unrelated to tri-type, but probably you'd see a correlation to tri-type. Yeah. Ingrid, okay, I have, Ingrid, I have a question. Who's talking? Wave. Yeah, I can't. Oh, there. I'm Go, uh, talking about my, uh, the IEQ. Um, well, as you can see, I'm a, a 692, which suggests that I have two of, two of my tri-type are in the positive outlook. However, in my harmonic stacking, the positive outlook is the lowest. So your main type there is obviously very dominant in your um, harmonic style, in your mm. approach to harmonizing, in your approach to problem solving. Mm. You are not going to draw on those two aspects of your tri-type as much as you are the emotional realness one of the six. Mm -hmm. Cool. Gail, you on mute? I have a question, thank you. Also, I'm, I'm those strongly in the positive outlook, but what about the wing? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're strongly influenced by a wing that's not in those three. Mm, definitely. So like my the, the, wing is strong. Definitely. I think that um, the Enneagram, as we know, it's so dynamic, it's so fluid. We've got two wings, we've got lines of um, stress and integration. We've got a tri-type and they're the lines from each of our tri-type elements. They're the wings for each of our tri-type elements. So the more I work with the Enneagram, the more fluidly I use it and the more uh, I see its fluidity in others. So I say if you can find some competency on your left, grab it. You know, it definitely <laughs> the whole Enneagram is accessible to us in one way or another. And it's, it's a tool of self-reading. You know, there you've got this map and this um, mirror that allows you primarily to take a moment to cultivate the inner witness, to go into a state of 
okay, I'm stuck in my stance of competency or I am stuck in my stance of positive outlook. And in that moment of awareness, it, that's what matters much more than do I have this wing or that wing. It's in that moment of awareness that you're able to think, okay, I'm neglecting competency in this moment. Where am I going to find it? And as a seven, I'm going to be thinking, okay, I'm going to go to five and I'm going to go to one. You know, you're probably going to have a different way of thinking, okay, I'm stuck in positive outlook. Where can I go? So the whole gift of the Enneagram is how we take this system of self-reading, this whole symbolic self-reading system, and we use it to create a moment in which we can ask ourselves, what is this moment inviting? What does this moment need from me? What do these people need from me? And then use this symbol and this map to see how we're going to find it. You know? And it could be from any type. Does that help at all? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Renata, thanks. thanks. Um, Inga, I've had a question uh, in the private chat about um, does the coaching companion of the IQ9 show the tri-type? So ca can I quickly just show how it does? I yeah. know... So for everybody, Ingrid, Ingrid likes Catherine Forbes' test. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, this will be, this is my coaching companion. Uh, That's so, bragging. <laughs> what's that bragging? No, it's not. That's brave. It's brave. brave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, this was, this was answered, I don't know, 2014 or something. Um, so just if, for, for those who, who are not sure, if I look at what's highlighted in color on the circle, so my tri-type, the two, three, and four, I am a three predominantly. So, so my feeling style in my tri-type is three. And then out of five, six, and seven in the thinking triad, what's highest is the five. So that's so that's my thinking style. And then out of eight, nine, and one in the action or body or gut center, the eight is highest. Um, and so I'm a three, five, eight. And it correlates to, if we look at the bar graphs, you can see eight, nine, and one, which is action, gut, or body clustered together, two, three, and four clustered together, five, six, and seven clustered together. So it's the bar graph that is highest in each of those. So in, out of eight, nine, and one, you can see eight's highest, three's highest, and then five's highest there. And so those are highlighted. That's unrelated to the lines, even if you have, even if your lines touch the same ones that are highlighted. And you can see it's unrelated. The fact that I'm a three in the feeling center, my dominant center of expression is action, uh, uh, overexpressed as is my self-preservation. Um, but if I come down to harmonics over here, you can see that 63% competency and low positive outlook, low uh, emotional realness. It's still called reactive, but it, 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 it's Russ calls it emotional realness now. Positive outlook is also called, um, uh, what did I say? The other word for positive outlook. Uh, anyway, I can't think of it now. All right. Um, so I hope that, that made that clear. And I think you wanted to say escapist, I think. Escapist. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, darling. Yeah. I was in a very recent Russ Hudson seminar, like in the last couple of weeks, and he says positive outlook, not escapist. So I would okay. think escapist... Yeah. is derogatory in the same way as reactive was derogatory. So yeah. it's positive outlook, emotional realness, and competency. Those are the so kind of most usual and appreciative um, labels for the triads. But you can see that the IEQ9 report has got tri-type tri there quite explicitly. They just don't use the word tri-type because it's a copyrighted name it's Catherine Forbes name um so that's that's why it's not there mm. I'm ready to go to breakout when you are in Sue's asking something um so you've got your percentages there is your tri-type then in the order of your percentages 
So say for example, my two was 83, my six was 54, and my nine was 70. So my try type isn't 269, but it would be 296. No, I don't think that it goes in order. You usually just say it in the order of your core type and then clockwise around. Catherine not... always says it in certain numbers um, and then she named, gives you the particular name for that order. No, the, or, the order doesn't change the name. There are 27 names, for one for each tri-type. And if you're a 269 or a 926 or a 692, you'll still be called the rescuer. Okay. The Good Samaritan, sorry. So, so it doesn't matter the order in which those numbers appear, the tri-type has a name in Forbes' uh, system. I know she does do the ordering um, differently. The way that we work with it is here, uh, just to start with your main type. That's the, really the main thing that matters. Start with the main type. Cool. I just popped up the names there just to give an idea of what we're talking about. All right. Shall we, shall we do um, breakouts and then go straight to, to tea breaking and then come back and debrief? That's a good idea. Great. So let's say um, 11 minutes breakout group and groups of how much? Four. Oh, yeah. And then, um, and then, uh, and then we'll just go to T. So let's say back at we just need like a ten minute break, right? Back at twenty. Shall we back at twenty five past to be safe? Yeah. Please, please Great. remind just remind the the question or the, the work for the break. Yes, I think yes. again, I got very sidetracked. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we went on a, a diversion there of different questions and insights. So this is the prompt for the breakout group. Ignore the timing and whatever. Think of your last big creative project, initiative or venture. So what you'll be offering to the group is, I am a type whatever from whatever um, planet you're from, your harmonic, and how your harmonic patterns showed up in the last, in the last project that you, that you did. So you're basically gonna be talking about what your home base is in terms of your harmonic triad, one of these three, and how it showed up in the last big thing that you had to do. Like the moments of recognition you've had today so far. You're gonna be sharing that. Is that clear enough, Brenda? Are we on it? Yes, thank you. Okay, Laka, thanks for clarifying. One of the terrible weaknesses of seven is giving clear instructions. So I usually um, am very grateful when somebody tests. One of the emotional realness types usually does. Thank you for doing it this time. A competency. <laughs> cool. Don't In, want to get um, it wrong. You don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> oh, yeah. God forbid. I'll still yeah. love you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right in you're going to be beamed into a breakout because i can't get you out and then you can oh, choose great, to play with me. Like thanks cool. all right cool so we're going into breakouts in and back at 25 past in three two one have fun Ciao. No, I can. I'm just waiting for two people to get. Sarita, are you there? Is she taking yes, away? I am. I'm just wondering why you aren't in a breakout. I'm going to move you to a breakout now. Thank you. Uh, where were you supposed to be? That's weird. Um, just before you do that, I was watching your... I was looking at your co your coaching companion. Yes. I think I think they photocopied yours and gave it to me. 
Are you serious, Rita? Oh, that's so funny. We are um, very close to the same. <laughs> oh my gosh, what happened with these timing of the breakouts? I don't know. Okay, um, I'm going to move you to a breakout now. Um, Assign to room three. Hey, Tony, how's it? You're on mute. I've been sitting with Karen, uh, listening yes. to the uh, listening to the discussion. Um, cool. But it wouldn't make sense for the two of us to be in the same group. Okay, cool. Let me go and put you into one. Um, nice to see you. It's been nice been to see you together. too. Cool. Let me find a group for you. Um, so I've got some groups of five and some groups of four. Okay, let me put you into room four. Okay, there we go, they've all gone. Awesome, hello my Nunukins. I am, but I just wanted to make sure that the spray counts weren't going to. So, so you've got a good sense of the gifts and the strengths of each of these um, um, triads. Now we're going to go into a little bit more on what are the shadow sides and the blind spots of each of them. And these are going to play out if you are in a stance. That's how Russ Hudson talks about it. He says you get stuck in a stance. And you know what it's like to be stuck in the stance of your personality style. If you, if you feel like you always have to be upbeat, you know, as the seven say. Um, it's a stance and you get stuck and you, you, you lose all flexibility. And that's what happens within the harmony triads as well, is that they, they become a fixation and a distortion of our attention and our awareness just in the way that anything else can be. So our subtype is a distortion, our main ego style is a distortion, and the harmonics bring a particular flavor of distortion to how we are seeing the world, how we're seeing the problem, how we're seeing other people. So the positive outlooks here, and you'll know this very well if you've had to work from them, work with them on something, is they often ignore the seriousness of a situation. They overlook um, key details. They downplay the risks and the dangers of things. They miss vital pieces of information and they avoid conflict. So I once worked with um, a nine and we had to implement a massive ERP system. And between the two of us, we consulted everybody for about a year and we made best friends with the entire organization and um, we really had very little appetite for signing off detailed processes. And you can imagine how successful that was and how furious people were with us because of um, our positive outlook. It was, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. There'll be some teething problems. We'll sort them out later. The teething problems were extremely substantive and caused a lot of people, a lot of inconvenience, time, money. It impacted the brand of our unit um, because we just didn't care about the problems. We just saw the good side of it. And you can imagine how frustrated people were with us, how frustrated the Enneagram ones and threes were with us in that organization and how furious the emotional realness types were with us because of the fact that we hadn't really listened to their concerns the whole time. So if you've worked with positive outlook types, you'll know very well um, how, how the shadow can play out and how much fury and frustration it can cause other people. 
Psychologically, the positive outlooks are defending against anxiety, depression, conflict. They're trying to accommodate everybody, be nice, love everybody. And it comes from a good intention. But as we know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, they, they are just overlooking a lot of stuff. So that just brings me preemptively to an important point is one of the keys in working with a team using the harmonics is to make sure that everybody in that team appreciates the good intent of the other triad. If you take one thing away from today, take that. Working with a team, make sure that every single person appreciates that the positive outlook comes with that positive outlook, not just because they're lazy or they don't want to deal with problems, but they're trying to make it a happy experience for everybody. And they want everyone to feel included and they want the humanity of the thing to come first. Stuff the ERP, we're gonna love each other at the end of this process. So that's what they're really trying to put first. And this, there's a similar thing for each of the other two, obviously. So if you can get a team to recognize the positive intent driving the the harmony strategy of each of these triads, then you've done a good thing. Then you've unlocked probably 80% of the value of this um, harmonics wisdom. Okay, let's look at the downside of the um, emotional realness. And we all know that the, the eights are the um, stereotypes stereotyped and um, labeled and everyone projects their darkness onto eights as the baddies of the Enneagram because of their emotional realness. And that's because eights don't hold back on saying what's on their mind. They can be very blunt and direct. They give direct feedback. They'll tell you if your idea is garbage. And obviously for people that can be very discouraging and frustrating to the point they would, where they become scared to actually take their ideas to an eight because they don't know whether the person will hear them. So that's just the eight example. The six, people become frustrated because sixes routinely will surface the risk. You know, you'll be having a strat session and everyone's speaking about, yay, we're going to build hydroponic vegetable farms on Mars. And the six is like, sorry, um, they want to they wanna put the spanner in the works with all the realis realism and the risks and the obstacles. And if they are stuck in the stance of doing that, then it can be frustrating. You can sometimes work in a team where you've got an Enneagram 6 who insists on their identity being devil's advocate. And they, they are attached to that identity as a fixation. That then becomes very irritating for people. So everybody, if they have half a grain of sanity and wisdom, is going to appreciate that it's a very good idea to step back, identify risks, put in place mitigation strategies. And, you know, it's very easy to appreciate that. What it's not easy to appreciate is a fixated stance. So a fixated eight becomes a bully. A fixated six becomes a naysayer. A fixated four drags things into endless spirals of emotional process. So for each one of these types, they're going to bring the shadow side of their harmonic. And the more fixated you are, the more you are going to trigger people from the other triads. They're just really going to feel your blind spot. And the Harass talks about level one conflict and then level two conflict. So level one conflict is where we're just grating a little bit and I'm trying to get my point across to you and you're not really listening. And, you know, there's a chance there that we could unlock value and you could say to me, okay, cool. I really appreciate your positive outlook. Let's spend some time this afternoon going through the risks. That would kind of bring us together and we would have a very healthy, useful conversation. If we don't manage to unlock that value and appreciate each other, 
it's going to escalate to the next level where it's going to be, I'm frustrated with you. I think you're a wet blanket. You're getting in the way of the plan. You're so negative. You're going to think you're delusional freak. Are you on mushrooms? And our project is going to hit some very serious um, snags. So not just is our relationship going to suffer, but the quality of what we produce is going to really suffer. We're not going to work wonders together. If I don't want to think about risks, and you are stuck in your single solution as either an eight or whatever. So basically the key message is how do we loosen the fixation of this? How do we ease out of our stuckness within a particular type, tri type, how many triad? For me, this is is the dominant thing of the Enneagram from end to end is softening. How do we soften and become responsive and appropriate to what the moment is asking of us? Okay. And then the competency side, blind spots here. You saw the robot picture for the competency triad at the beginning and the fact that the marriage will end because it's just so functional and lacks um, human vitality and dynamism, not dynamism, um, uh, romance or whatever. It's, it's got an inhuman quality to it because of the gift of being able to be rational and step back. So the, the gift and the shadow are always identical. It's always two sides of the same coin. So you've got people that are gifted at stepping back and coming to a rational solution. Surprise, surprise that the shadow side and the blind spot is feeling kind of cold and disconnected and so solution oriented that you're missing the emotional authenticity, you're missing the depth, you're missing the tenderness. So, you know, it's, it's very obvious what the shadow side of each of these triads will be. So the, the ones are sticking with the rules at the expense of the feelings. The threes are efficiencies and the feelings get lost. And the fives are the solution and the conceptual design at the expense of the feelings and the emotional realness. So you can, you can see very clearly what goes missing, how the other two go missing from each triad. Is this making sense? Let's hear any questions, comments, feedback. No, I think it makes a lot of sense. Go on. Yeah, I, I echo that as well. That's Craig here. Um, for me, I'm an 837, so like I said to my group, it's almost like the jackpot. I'm one in each of them, as you alluded to earlier, Ingrid. Um, mm. But I also concur with the fluidity of it all. So sometimes I feel my positive outlook is stronger than my, um, and I lead with my eight. My positive outlook can be stronger than my eight or my efficiency. It, 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 it's like tides going up and down or, you know, the sun going up and coming up in the morning and setting in my, it can be at different point, points in time, which I suppose is the beauty of, of human nature. Exactly. And that's such a lovely thing to hear also because eight is also very much in the virtue of innocence is the softening and the mm. fluidity. And the, the growth path for eight is into being able to see things in the way that you've just articulated. There's a soft fluidity, a responsivity, an acknowledgement that, that that's part of the beauty is, is that. Mm. There's no... Sorry? So I was going to say, I remember an article from when I first did that Enneagram 1 with you and Casper, where you said the eight is a, a marshmallow wrapped in around by barbed wire, and that has resonated and stuck with me right from the starter. Mm. So thanks again. Mm.
Thank you. Thanks, Craig. That's helpful. And thanks, Getty, for always having the names of the tri-type archetypes ready. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> what is your type, Getty? You're on mute, Gate. The rescuer, 268 rescuer. There you yeah. go. <laughs> okay. Hey, tell us, tell us something. Hmm? I'm with a team at the moment that has got so little positive outlook and they are so incredibly strong in their realness and in their action. But it's such a challenge for me now listening to this to see how to draw them into a what's missing conversation. Hmm. Hmm. And that's, that's the trick, is to be able to put the mirror in front of them. You know? So this is, this is one team, put this mirror in front of another team, is this is what you've got. You know? What's going missing here? There's no six. How are you going to survive without no, with no six, five, and two? You know, it's like a disability that you've got here. So, and I think every team has a different type of of disability depending on what's missing. Okay. Any other feedback from the so far on this on the shadow sides and the blind spots? Okay. So um Renata, process suggestion from here. Second um, how, how much more have we got in terms of slides? And I don't want to run too much over time and we book till four. Um, I've got a couple of slides on the integration. So let me just touch back on those points and we can take them into the breakout group. Okay, cool. so the next breakout group is really about coming to realize how we are irritating other people from our dominant harmonic triad how we might be in a fixated stance in terms of, you know, I always need to be upbeat and tell everyone it's fine when the whole building is burning down. Um, and to appreciate more about our integration. So on the integration side, I already mentioned it a couple of, of times, but it's, it's the most important point from today is that the harmony is both within you and externally. So what you are trying to do is harmonize these three triads within. You have got to find within yourself access to the positive outlook, the competence, and the realness, and be very aware of what's missing and right. how you are overstuck in one or the other. We can be all three at the same time, and we need to be able to be fluid and responsive in our integration of the three. Russ speaks about the very higher purpose of this integration, which is what happens when we integrate all three within. He speaks about how we end up with the grown up, spiritually mature human being, someone who is compassionate, wise, grounded, and capable. Which, can you hear how, how wonderful that sounds? Imagine we were all walking around with full access to all of our capabilities, agreeing on what matters to us, what problems are important, what is possible, and how we are actually going to do something about them in the way that we're going to see visible, real, sustainable, robust um, solutions being put in place. And that's going to happen if we manage to harmonize these things and step into our full adult responsible um, potential in the integration of these three. So it allows us to become curious and it allows us to really um, meet the people that we might have considered to be our enemies in bringing the best of them. And he's, this phrase at the bottom here, a highly emergent creativity is what emerges in the alchemy of these three. So it's almost like the law of three. It's, it's as these three come together, 
totally new creative possibilities emerge that weren't visible from within each isolated harmonic camp. Genuinely new possibilities are going to arise out of the alchemy of these three harmonic triads. So that's really um, the main point. So let's have our other um, breakout group maybe for a shorter time. I don't know if people can stay on for a little bit, but um, you want to frame the question, Renata? We spoke about it a bit earlier. Um, I'm just first wondering if I should just put everybody back into the same rooms with the same people, because then you already understand a little bit of the framing behind it, yeah? Not, right. not do fresh room. Plan. Um, I know some people have had to leave already. So, um, so it, it, let's just discuss, and I know it already came up. I joined a breakout room and, and it already came up, but just um, how does it dis, how does the fixation on your overexpressed harmonic disserve? So how does be having too much competency in my case, you know, being a machine disserve in situations and how would it serve to integrate more, particularly of the other two or the one that is most missing for you, the most underexpressed. So what we're looking for is subconsciously at the moment, whatever you're overexpressing means that you're seeing that as being um, the way to go because that's your preference. So that's the muscle that you built, right? And so part of integration, what helps us integrate is if we can see the disservice in that, right? Instead of saying, oh, I just cut out my emotions and I fix things, right? How does that disserve? And at the same time, how would it serve me if I brought more emotional realness or, um, uh, you know, the ones that are, that are particularly low to my process? Yeah. So how does the highest one disserve? How does the lowest one, how would it serve to bring more into our process? So Vanessa, thanks, darling. No problem. So that's the brief. Call me into the room if you want some more clarity on that but i'll put everybody into the same room how long should we do for in eight minutes let's do five because if we're in the same groups and we've already touched on the stuff it's okay. going to be easier cool okay, like, thanks. So let me five minutes um all right so five minutes with a 15 second countdown and we're going into breakout in three two one Okay, I don't know. I'm going to have to reassign. Okay, I'm assigning you. Uh, Marlene, which room or who are you within a room? You're in room seven. Yeah, okay. I'm going to put you there and put Brett back with you. Sorry. Um, and I was in that uh, same room. Oh, Natasha. Okay, sorry. I, I, I didn't want to redo the room. So let me put you there. Uh, Marlene, why didn't you go there? Uh, Brenda, where were you? Who you were? I was with, with Karen and Monet and Zahira, who's now just disappeared. And okay. uh, Laddie. And Laddie. Laddie's you also gone. One. Uh, okay, so there's nobody in room one at the moment. So I need to put you with somebody else. Um, let me, I'm going to put you with Craig and Gail and Sue because there's not a lot of people there. Um, and Karen, who are you with? With Brenda. Okay, so I'm going to put you with Brenda in that room then. 